and recording. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Chip Gartner, and I am echoing as the <laughs> Assistant VP for Communications at the University of Rochester Medical Center. Thanks for joining us today for what will be a fascinating discussion. Social distancing and isolation during the pandemic are having an effect on flattening <clears throat> the curve of COVID-19, but with that also comes an impact on all health as adults and children adopt to this new normal in their lives. Today, we're joined by two experts from the UR Medicine Mental Health and Wellness uh, Division to discuss how people can best cope with their current situation. With us in the studio is Dr. Yates Conwell, who's a professor in the URMC Department of Psychiatry and director of the UM, URMC Office for Aging Research and Health Services. And off-site, in front of a spiffy background that we'll see momentarily, is Dr. Caroline Silva, who's joining us uh, remotely. She's a senior instructor in the Department of Psychiatry who studies social connectedness. Before uh, we turn things over to Dr. Conwell, I wanted to thank Morgan Underwood of our Interpretive Services Department and Will and Chris our ASL interpreters for making today's live conversation accessible to the deaf community. And Dr. Conwell, do you wanna frame the discussion and then we'll open up for some media questions? Uh, sure, thanks, Chip. Um, you know, we, we've learned a tremendous amount about uh, the coronavirus and, and how to manage the best that we can as we work our way through this pandemic. And it's absolutely clear that social distancing is a fundamental necessary part of that. Uh, but it's also important and the opportunity I think that I'm glad to have today with my colleague and, and you all is to talk about the cost of social distancing and how we can mitigate that. The cost is on uh, our mental health and the potential impacts can be great, but they can be managed. And just as we need to take care of our physical health in, in um, the face of the threats of coronavirus, we also need to take care of our mental health. So well, let's bear down on that and not forget the importance of that. Thank you. I should mention that Dr. Conwell is not masked today because he's the only unmasked person in our studio and he is socially distant from our crew and our interpreters. Um, with that, just going down the Zoom list, 13 Wham News is up first. I uh, will, uh, Tyler Brown. Oh, good afternoon, Tyler. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for, uh, for this time to talk with us. Um, we were just wondering, um, can isolation um, accelerate dementia or short-term memory? That's a great question. And, and it, it is clear that, that, when an individual experiences stress over a long period of time related to uh, isolation, experiencing loneliness, for example, that it can result over time in uh, decrements in cognitive function. So the short answer is, is yes. Um, I think there's another dimension to that though, just to touch on that when anybody who has a vulnerability to cognitive problems, um, perhaps very early in the process, well before um, they might be diagnosed with dementia, for example, then uh, disruptions in lifestyle, in routine, uh, presence of anxiety, depression, all these things can contribute also to the emergence of, of confusion and things like that. Do you have a follow-up, Tyler? Yes, I was just also wondering in terms of the um, healthcare workers who are on the front lines of uh, this pandemic, um, they're obviously seeing people sick every day. They're seeing people pass away. Um, what is being done by UR URMC to help uh, the frontline workers and their mental health as they go through this very stressful job? Well, Tyler, I feel like I should probably jump in there first. I, I think um, we should help answer that question offline because there are quite a few services from our employee wellness plan that have been put in place. And I'm not sure Dr. Silva and Dr. Conwell are the best people to address that, but perhaps Dr. Silva or Dr. Con Conwell, if you want to just talk about the stress that frontline workers do go through. And Tyler, we'll get, we'll get back to you offline about the services that are in place specifically for our employees. 
I might jump in uh, and, and then invite uh, Dr. Silver to comment as well. Um, you know, the, the stress of this is enormous for everybody involved. Uh, you know, we're, we're focusing on those folks uh, isolated at home uh, with the worries that that entails. Uh, there's, of course, all the people who have been impacted by loss of their uh, paychecks and those kinds of things. And then there is a very important and large cohort of people, uh, the providers, taking care of uh, the individuals with COVID or sick who are certainly experiencing that as well. Um, I think that we're very sensitive to that. And certainly in the Department of Psychiatry, that's part of what we see as a, our job is supporting all of the workforce within uh, URMC and, and then beyond our walls as well. So we do as, Chip said, have a number of programs in place that are specifically designed to provide that kind of support. Dr. Silva, did you want to talk about the stress that uh, clinical frontline workers go through? Yeah, I think um, I echo everything that uh, Yates just said. And I also wanted to add that I think one thing that sometimes gets overlooked is that um, some of our providers are also kind of carrying multiple hats or dual roles. So I know I work with our Spanish speaking clinic. Um, a lot of our therapists are not just um, doing their kind of regular individual therapy, but they're also uh, trying to help by providing information um, about like, you know, social policies, resources, things like that about the pandemic to their patients who may not have access uh, to English language resources. Um, and so I think uh, with the resources that UVAR has provided us, um, both for kind of employee health and well-being and support, um, that has been uh, really helpful. Um, uh, but it's something that providers should keep uh, an eye on their own sort of mental health and well-being as well. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tyler. Um, next, I see uh, Brett Dahlberg from WSXI News. Brett, do you want to ask a question? Yeah, I'd love to. Uh, thanks. Um, I, I wonder how well, to what extent are you using teletherapy or telepsychiatry to reach people during this time and how well is it working? You know, um, maybe that's one of the silver linings in a way of, of this crisis that it's really propelled us forward in delivering more and more services remotely. People have for a long time, I think, actually been um, uh, very pleased with the kind of services that they get by use of telemedicine or telepsychiatry. Um, but we've been constrained by certain of the regulatory and billing uh, practices that were required to follow from actually doing it until recently with changes in how the state of New York and, and how, how uh, CMS uh, uh, allows us to provide those services with reimbursement that enable them. Um, those changes have caused a tremendous explosion in the amount of work we're doing in that way. So right now in the Department of Psychiatry, our mental health programs are delivering, I believe it's something on the order of 85 or 90 percent of our services on an outpatient basis by remote technology and people like it you know it's uh it's not always easy particularly under these circumstances to negotiate a big complicated place like this the parking and then beyond that so um, being able to actually see the provider in your own home is a very special and uh, meaningful experience um, so it it's really been a very positive kind of change that we're hoping is going to be sustained over the long haul. Caroline, I know you, you have um, some cautions about our ability to use those kinds of services in some segments of the population. Yeah, I think um, it's, you know, uh, at least the Department of Psychiatry has done a really good job of implementing telehealth across a variety of our clinics and services. Um, Although, you know, sometimes we are still looking for ways to reach some of our population that may not have access to um, iPhones, Androids, tablets, right? Um, a lot of the population that we work with in our space shaking clinic may not have um, data plans for their phones that they can use to do video visits um, or Wi-Fi. 
Um, we've been able to do a lot of telehealth just via phone calls, which has been well received in our, our clinic. Um, and we've noticed a reduction in actually something like sometimes like no shows, which often for our patients were due to logistical barriers like transportation, um, getting to, to U of R. Uh, one thing that we're trying to pursue with our clinic is looking for funding opportunities to get um, our patients who don't have the resources for uh, telehealth, particularly video telehealth, um, to be able to provide them those resources during this time so that we can reach so that we make this accessible for everybody and not just um, some of our patient population. Brett, I'll ask you if you have a follow-up. And Lee Singer from Minority Reporter, you'll be next. Thanks, I do. Um, I, I want to know in, in the general population and then also specifically in the population of people who don't have access to reliable internet uh, or, or smartphones or whatever else they need, what's missing from the when you can't have those meetings in person, what's missing over doing them by phone or by video chat? Caroline, you wanna take that? Yeah, I mean, we've, we've discussed this a little bit with our, our providers. Um, I, I think sometimes uh, you can get a sense when you're meeting with somebody in person about differences, um, for example, in how they're presenting or their affect as opposed to maybe like what they're reporting to you. So um, even just how someone is, is presenting, right, behaviorally. And so sometimes with uh, telehealth where it's just telephone, that's a little bit more difficult because um, you can't see the person. Um, and so you might want to ask, I think, more in-depth questions or more follow-up questions or different questions and not just make assumptions. Um, with video um, telehealth, which a lot of our clinics have been doing, um, a lot of providers told me that it actually works pretty well. Um, what they have to be most aware of is considerations with like privacy distractions, you know, the when the person's at home, um, are there other people in the home, are there noises, um, things like that. But, um, I. I think it's just something that providers are, are aware of and sometimes have discussions with patients as well about sort of how to sort of overcome some of those differences to in-person versus over telehealth. Thanks, Dr. Silva and Patty Singer from Minority Reporter. Do you have a question? Uh, yes, I do. Thank you. Um, Dr. Silva, we know that there can be cultural norms around how people are accepting of mental health and first even acknowledging that have a mental health um, issue that ought to be addressed. So knowing that those cultural norms in, in some of our communities, how do you need to then reach out to those communities to make sure that they are aware and that this is something that um, is, is available to them and a, culture, a cultural norm should not get in the way? Yeah, um, I think that that's a really great question. Um, one thing that I think like our clinic has been trying to do and not just providing our current patients with resources, but you know, linking to the community is we um, have a stronger relationship with uh, like um, Ibero, which is our community, one of the community agencies that serves uh, Spanish speaking Latino families. Um, and even before COVID um, kind of impacted us, we had had sort of meetings with, with their staff and their board in the past, just to sort of coordinate services and resources. Um, and having, I think, those links has been really helpful even now in this time. And so when we're thinking about like cultural differences and how accepting, accepting people are of mental health, things like stigma, um, as well as telehealth, um, mm -hmm. you know, I think partnering with a lot of our community agencies that are sort of aware of what that looks like in different communities um, and really listening to their feedback about what's going to be helpful in connecting with people, providing services, things that we need to consider when we're providing services, right? Um, so that can be like someone's home environment, right? Like how accessible really is doing telehealth with them is really important. Um, and they've been great partners, so. Um, there is a follow-up to that, knowing that uh, Dr. Mendoza is a, is a colleague of yours as part of the medical center. Um, do, you need, do you have his ear on bringing in mental health to how and when uh, we can start to reopen the, the, the community. How important is the mental health approach to that gonna be as not just the physical 
approach of preventing COVID, but the mental health aspect of that. I might just say, mm -hmm. Patty, thank you for that. The, um, the things that, that we've noticed, I think it's really important over time is that the understanding of the appreciation of mental health as a dimension of health impacted by the virus and by our needed response to the virus uh, and its other impacts socially and psychologically has been considerably heightened. So that's one part of it. The other is I think that there's, I'm feeling much less stigma in general in the community about talking about the psychological and social dimensions of this crisis and this illness. Um, so it, uh, it is all part of the conversation and I'm confident uh, at the leadership level here and with Dr. Mendoza at the Department of Health um, that these very much are part of the conversation. Thank you. Thanks, Patty. Next we have uh, Rebecca Pfaff from the BRRC Channel 8. Hi, everybody. How are you? Good, um, Hi, Chip. Anyway, so doctors, I just wanted to ask you, you know, I have a lot of my friends, a lot of my girlfriends are moms, um, and a lot of my mom friends are working from home, and they're asking me, how do I feel not, how do I not feel guilty from, like, not being able to do things with my kids? Um, you know, they're still having to work, and kids are home playing with the dog and wanting mommy to play but she's like now nah, I gotta work um and it's making mom feel really um guilty they're feeling really spread really thin because they're trying to work they've got their kids in front of them it's a lot on parents um especially parents with well I don't want to say especially but parents with young children so what advice do you have for all the moms and dads out there that are like as they say ready to kill their kids Um, I'll, I'll jump in really quickly. Um, you know, one thing that I've thought about with, uh, you know, families and sort of like what we've been calling like sort of like this new normal, um, is that a lot of times, you know, kids flourish, especially when, and adults do too, when we establish routines. Um, so sometimes it may not be about being able to do it all, but being able to do what you're doing consistently. Um, and routines can be really helpful for, you know, Know, well-being um, as well as it just helps them kind of have expectations and they kind of know what's going to be happening on a day-to-day -day basis um, and then for the parents I think a lot of those feelings are very natural and normal um, in what is an abnormal situation uh, okay. and making sure that you're sort of maybe taking even like a sliver of time to promote your own self-care as well is going to be important there fabulous thank you um, <laughs> Uh, I, I think that covers it really quite well. Where, where my mind was going as Caroline was talking was about the need to take care of yourself and that not to beat yourself up. Uh, this is a, it's a hard time and there's a lot of balls to keep in the air. Um, and to take time for yourself as a mom, as, as a, a father in the home as well. Um, and to be sure that you're taking full advantage of the other opportunities that there might be out there to get together with your own friends and, and share ideas about what works. Um, and this is the, the social connectedness uh, focus that we need to keep by doing things with our, our friends through Zoom or Skype or just a call on a regular basis. Try to have some fun too. Thank you. I'll tell them they need to call me more often if they want to feel better, right? Thank you guys so much. I'm all set. Thank you, Rebecca. We've got the WATC channel 10 on the line. Is there a reporter um, who would like to ask a question? Um, not hearing one there. Spectre News. Do you have a report? You're unmuted at Spectrum. We've got a busy news day. And uh, you want to unmute all, Corey? And I'll just. 
As we figure out how to unmute all, we'll, we'll just open it up in case there's anyone I've missed that wants to ask questions. Hi, this is Sandra Knispel here with University of Rochester Communications. May I jump in with a quick question? Sure, Sandra. Hi, I saw um, a piece in the Wall Street Journal that quoted um, uh, a, somebody from, from the university, but I've also seen it myself on social media that uh, adults are posting everywhere that they're having happy hours, virtual happy hours with their friends, um, and the knock-on effects on families. And I'm wondering if you're seeing some of that also, that these people who prior to COVID would just have a glass of one here and there and all of a sudden it's becoming the slippery slope that they're increasing the alcohol intake and at the same time there's added stress at home whether you're seeing that and what your advice for that would be yeah that, that, there are myriad impacts of social uh, isolation social disconnections on mental health uh, one of them is the risk for increased substance use uh, the risk being in particular those who've had prior problems with, with excessive drinking, for example, or drug use, people who have uh, uh, developed over time a pattern of using substances as a means of coping with some of the stress. So that's certainly something uh, you're referring to that we need to be very aware of and, and uh, prepared to help with. But there are other mental health problems that emerge as well. Depression, of course, uh, anxiety problems. Uh, we hear about uh, exacerbations of interpersonal discord and, and uh, even interpersonal violence in homes where uh, that may have been a problem, but with isolation is exacerbated also. Uh, all of these things are, are part of the consequences that, uh, that we've been referring to. Thank you, Sandra. Dr. Silver, did you want to address that question? No, I, I think I would just echo what uh, Yates said. We've got about um, five minutes left, and uh, Patty Singer, I saw in the chat that you'd like to ask another question. So as long as we're within time, uh, why don't you go ahead? <laughs> they said so many questions, so little time on this. Thanks, Chip. I appreciate it. So how is this social distancing different for people who are isolated anyway? Uh, people who live alone, people who may be retired, so they've lost that work connection. I mean, there are people every day living what the general public has lived for the past six weeks, so how is, the, how is this different for them and possibly exacerbating their own issues? And I have a follow-up that would go with money to pay for mental health issues once we're through the pandemic issues, so. Well, we know that social isolation um, is a problem in many different respects. People need to be with other people, need to feel connected. And there's certainly variation in the degree to which that uh, is important. Um, but it was the case long before COVID uh, that uh, when people became disconnected socially from others, that they were, we knew they would become at greater risk for dementia, that, that question came up earlier, also for heart disease and hypertension, uh, depression, uh, immune system problems, and so on. One of the uh, problems, of course, here is that COVID has just made that that much worse for more people. Now there are people who who do just fine with that. Uh, loneliness is the key here. It's the subjective experience of being disconnected from others and, and that that's distressing. There are people who are very comfortable that way and, and that's okay. Um, but where people, there's a mismatch between what the individual needs from others by way of support and connection and what they are able to get that's where we begin to worry. Older people, for the reasons that Patty, you were saying, are, I think, particularly vulnerable over time because of things like widowhood and functional impairments that may isolate them in their home if they can no longer drive, they're no longer working, these kinds of things. So as a geriatric psychiatrist, uh, that's a, a group of people who uh, I worry about. At the same time, just in as in other parts of the age uh, spectrum, there are older folks who are real survivors. They've, they've learned over time about how to um, make close connections with a few people, and they can do very well under these circumstances as well. 
we think of older people as very vulnerable here, but I, I think we also need to look to the older person who's managing the uh, COVID experience well for, for the lessons they can teach us about how to make this work for us. Thank you. And the other issue would be people talk about, you talk about this awareness of mental health. And everybody now is on the mental health bandwagon, right? Where have they been for years on it? But budgets are strapped. Uh, a lot of mental health organizations are nonprofit in the community. If we continue with this wonderful awareness of mental health, how can we carry this through when we don't have a pandemic? And how can we pay for this throughout so that mental health truly now has that parity with physical health? Well, I'd say part of the opportunity in doing that is then beginning to move towards prevention and wellness, uh, which is everybody's business here. So while you're right that the provision of mental health services in the standard fashion that we've provided them uh, is going to be uh, a challenge and, and expensive in many respects, um, there are other approaches that we can take. We talked about uh, tele health services, for example, they are inherently cheaper. I think we can make that go a long way. We've been learning about things uh, like the self-help, from the self-help movement about the use of apps, for example. There's a very exciting uh, virtual reality uh, cognitive uh, behavior therapy app that folks around here are working on that then could be used by the individual themselves up to a point that can be a very effective, uh, uh, effective way to manage some of the earlier phases of distress that prevent them from moving on to the level of seriousness that requires the kind of care that's more expensive that you're referring to. So I think it does need, need to broaden our scope and think creatively about prevention and early intervention as well as the uh, acute kind of stuff that we do so well here. Thank you. Patty, thanks. We're uh, nearing the end of our half hour. I did want to ask Dr. Silva if he has any um, final thoughts he'd like to share about the, the interconnectedness and isolation in the current time. Um, I think one thing I would like to do is just provide uh, advice or a suggestion. Um, uh, a lot of what we do with social connectedness is um, also create connectedness plans. Um, so sort of um, to plan ahead for how to promote connectedness for yourself during this time and, and moving forward or any time that there's big changes in your life. Um, and what we try to help people plan around are three things, uh, usually sort of how you're thinking. Um, so, you know, what kind of self-talk, um, what are you focusing on, um, what you're doing. So what kind of behaviors can you engage in even in our limited circumstances that can promote connectedness for you. So is that making more telephone calls? Is that trying to do video chats? Um, and then also what you're feeling in your body. So taking care of that part too. So using things like mindfulness, meditation, self-soothing to sort of manage physical feelings of anxiety, um, making you're still getting exercise uh, and, and sort of thing to take away would just be that Social distancing means physical distancing, but not necessarily um, lack of connection with other people. And if we can plan for that, then we'll all be uh, probably better off. Thank you, Dr. Silva. Dr. Kamal, did you wanna make any, share any final thoughts? Well, thank you uh, and all of you for your questions and the opportunity to raise this issue and, and keep it in the forefront of our thinking. Um, you know, this is gonna be around for a while. Uh, I think the opportunity here, the obligation for us all is to think creatively about how to um, assure that under circumstances like we're living in now with COVID that uh, we have new ways of maintaining, making and maintaining social connections. Uh, using technology is certainly going to be a part of that. Um, and uh, I look forward to the, the old American ingenuity coming into the play here and, and making uh, the circumstances that we're, we're currently under bearable as they become more routine. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Yates Conwell and Dr. Caroline Silva of the URMC uh, Mental Health and Wellness Unit and Department of Psychiatry. Um, thanks to our reporters for joining us today and uh, Will and Chris, along with Morgan Underwood, our 
ASL interpretation team, Corey Smith on the Zoom and Jeff Mead on the camera. I appreciate everyone for today's discussion. Uh, if anyone in the media has follow-up questions, please direct them to mediainquiries at urmc.rochester.edu. And with that, we'll say thanks and wish everyone a good afternoon.